And I think that that often is misunderstood when dating because I think there's a lot of I'm going to save her. Marshall made that mistake with Jackie saying you're like a project I could fix, a person I could help. And I think a lot of men do want to be that shining knight. And I think Jackie and women like Jackie parts of women like Jackie, I wouldn't say the whole of Jackie, I think they do want men to come in and rescue them. I think they don't want to be seen as a project. They want to be seen as a princess in the making, or they want to be seen as a girl who's worthy of your love. And I think that Marshall had this like sort of arrogance about being such a good person that he could save Jackie. And I think that was what the one moment I thought he was kind of ugly where I was like, oh, that was like an ugly point of character for him. But I don't think he meant it maliciously. So Let's play with this. Okay. When you're dating someone, you're talking about whether or not they're like an ugly person, not physically, like their their energy, their vibe, like, ooh, this person makes me feel a way. And we're not even talking about the way Arena felt about Zach. That's different. We're talking about like, oh, that's kind of ugly. Like you kind of have ugly ideas about people. Marshall, I think in that moment was a little ugly. He he had a disgusting thought about Jackie. Like, I'm gonna, she's a project. That's the wrong way to look about look at your spouse. You should look at your spouse as not a project to fix, not your opportunity to be a white knight, not your opportunity to save your partner. I think this is my belief. Instead, you should look at your partner as somebody who's like a capable adult who's having a hard time, who's figuring it out, or an adult who's a hot mess but figuring it out, or at least they're on track to. The idea of needing to save people, I think, is a big part of society's problems. The path to road is paved in good intentions. We're always trying to help people through the means of what we think is good, and I think think sometimes it really comes out ugly. Let's talk about Love is Blind. Hello everyone, welcome back to today's video. My name is Brittany Simon. Before we jump into Love is Blind season four, I'm drinking a tea today. This is the Viking tea. It has organic peppermint, organic bilberry leaf, and organic bilberries. In today's video, I have tons of notes in front of me. We're gonna talk about Love is Blind season four. You guys know this is one of the only reality shows I watch from beginning to end. I got hooked on season one. I'm obsessed with interpersonal relationships, and this show does not leave any Anything wanting. I, well, okay, maybe they leave some things wanting, but in order to explore what it means to be a person, I think using love is blind is probably good. In the past, I would think, why are we using reality TV shows to understand ourselves? Because it's not real. But the thing is, after being a YouTuber for a decade, I've learned that there is a realness to online content creation, whether you're on TV doing reality TV or you're doing YouTube. So in the past, I would think, well, reality TV shows, let's say like MTV. If I watch something on MTV as a teenager, I'd think there's no way this is real. This is not real people. But to be honest with you, people do like share authentic versions of, of themselves in reality TV shows and on YouTube. So this is like an opportunity for us to actually use reality TV to learn more about ourselves. So I've got the cast in front of me. I've got my notes in front of me. I think the theme to... I think the theme to reflect on while using Love is Blind as the sort of jumping off point is the deservingness of love. Who deserves love? The idea that one is in many ways an extremely difficult person to be in a relationship with may sound rather improbable and even at points offensive. Yet fully understanding and readily and graciously admitting to this possibility might be the surest way of making sure one is an endurable proposition over the long term. Do you guys think people deserve love? Everyone deserves love. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> my type of bitch. <laughs> if you want to be loved, you need to be yourself. This piece of advice offered in slightly altered forms depending on whether one is seeking romantic love, success, or friendship feels like a big fat lie. We learn from a young age that to be oneself, to be messy, ugly, needy, and stupid, isn't lovable. Crying because we feel hurt or launching into a temper tantrum is met with the disapproval of our caretakers. Here we may hear the echoes of Jordan Peterson's parental advice. An angry child should sit by himself until he calms down. Then he should be allowed to return to normal life. That means the child wins instead of his anger. The rule is, come be with us as soon as you can behave properly. The child learns to be accepted for not who they are, but how they are. Their worth is dictated by their behavior. Later on, we note that being too vulnerable or weird drives away romantic prospects. What we are left with is an ultimatum. You can either be yourself or you can be loved. 
and so our relationships become cyclical. Well, you could argue that every human being on the planet deserves a form of love, and I think that's pretty reasonable, and it's really kind to think like that. Oh, I want to be loved. Of course, I want other people to be loved. The dilemma you end up facing, though, I think is the complications around cohabitation and or having someone in your space. As an example, already, I want to gravitate towards the toxicity we saw in Love is Blind because I think it shows when you put good people in a room how they can make each other worse. In some instances with Marshall and Jackie, as an example, a couple that I think you and I both knew weren't going to make it. And at the same time, they do sort of fit a tropey archetype of a couple that could actually work. The damaged girl who has the more stable husband. The dilemma is they're both missing certain characteristics to make that trope work. So I'm watching this show. I'm watching Jackie. I'm watching Marshall try their best through their toxic previous backgrounds to be better. Now, I don't know exactly Marshall's toxicity in his life, but he must have had something enough that he has the lingo of somebody who's gone to therapy he seems self-aware, though he's working on it. He's got a strength to him and yet a weakness. There's something in Marshall that's definitely a push and pull. I think at one point with Brett and Kwame, there was a conversation where Marshall said, you know, men like us don't always get to express our feelings. And on a spectrum of masculinity, you would have Brett... Kwame and Marshall. So out of the three men, Marshall definitely has more of the feminine energy, which of course I love in a relationship myself, but not every straight woman like Jackie would want that energy in her man. Jackie obviously comes from the kind of background where women like her expect men to be very dominant and very uh, overwhelming, which yes, could be very attractive in a healthy way, but in a toxic way, girl, you're going to end up with a guy who does the worst. You know, if a guy... If a guy is so insecure that he needs to show his dominance by physically pushing you around or yelling at you, I don't think that's healthy, right? And at the same time, maybe Marshall isn't the kind of masculinity she was looking for, which is fine. I just want us to really pay attention to the 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 loops we find ourselves in, right? If you find yourself always in toxic relationships, ask yourself that question. Did I need masculinity in my man or did I need stability? And the question really comes down to your preferences. The other night, she says that I needed to pass up. Look how emotional he is. The way that she made me feel in that moment when she said that I wasn't a man. He's being honest. I wasn't doing the wrong man stuff. That hurts because I truly, genuinely do love this girl. I don't know if I believe that totally. I think he loves her that in a way. Yeah. For what reason? I'm not about to play this game this shit. What game are we playing? You didn't want to sit here and, and talk. You're like, I'm leaving. Mm. What else am I supposed to do? What else am I supposed to do? Sit in my feelings and sleep next to someone who said that I was not man enough for them? Mm. I never said you weren't man enough for me. I just said to be more aggressive. We don't have sex. They're using bro. different words. We don't have sex. These don't mean the oh, same that, thing. Oh, that's, 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 that's on my account. I'm just saying, do something. Like, try and get me in the mood or something. Ooh. I have been nothing but down for you. Marshall. You're going to give me a migraine. Because you're irking the shit out of me. Oof. It's always what you feel and how you think. And then when I am aggressive, and then, and then when I am aggressive, aggressive, you shut me See, down. aggressive is different here. Aggressive. That's not who I am. Okay, so if you well, can't accept me, for, if, if you can't accept me for that, then, then I don't know what to tell you. Dominant like, versus aggressive. Right for some people, they do want the masculinity over the consistency or reliability. Some people do want the femininity without the consistency and the reliability. Some people want both masculine and feminine with the reliability. Every person is going to have a different combination of those things. So Marshall is a person who has pretty good confidence, but I think he still needs some work, right? Like me and Marshall in a room, I think it's pretty clear that I've, I think I'm so, like my confidence is not in question, right? Like sometimes on occasion it wavers, but Marshall has this energy around him that says to me that he's not always the most confident, which I think sends a message to Jackie that he's not going to be masculine enough to take care of her. But of course, if you're like me and you've bubble topped and you've met so many people from different bubbles, you know it's not exactly, that's not exactly it. It's not that his lack of masculinity won't allow him to be a good partner. He's plenty masculine, but he's not masculine in the particular way that Jackie is used to that sends signals to her brain that says, I'm going to be protected and loved. What do you want? I want to have a conversation with you. I want to be able to speak my piece and speak it clearly. Mm. Speak your piece and speak it clearly. Do it. Please. Do it. I'm always kissing on you. I'm always rubbing on you. I'm always doing these things. What do you do for me? Love that language. Why I'm confused. You have Differences, bro. You make me feel seduced or special or anything. I don't make you feel like nothing. So why the fuck are you still with me if I didn't make you feel like nothing? Because I see you as a project and I saw potential. I thought that you were just going to mm. come around to me at some point. I was oh, waiting around really for you. really wild. Not good. I'm a, I'm a project. I saw you as a project. You have not been in a real relationship before. You also say that you're not emotionally available at times. I've been in relationships before. I had that experience, so I saw 
What you, what you I see the fucking puppeteer, and I'm a puppet. No. She's afraid of the controlling. Mm. I, I That's, said, I oof. said, project. The fucking emotions are going, but what I see in you is limitless potential, and I know that I can be that person to bring that out of you. That's something. That's I don't see you as good. A I see you as someone who I can uplift and empower, and I told you that from jump. Mm. This is what marriage is. This is what a committed relationship looks like. A toxic one. conversations even when we don't want to. True. You know exactly how I feel about you. Mm. I don't hold anything back. Mm. I fucking love you. I don't believe that I love you. I don't believe it. Maybe. I don't know. Ugh, I hate this. I can fix you, baby. You. A lot of the time uh, during the last three years when I was dating people, I would date these guys with very specific energies. I date men and women, but men in particular with very specific energies. And those are the men that I brought home to my family because, you know, they're very anti-queer. So they're not going to meet any of my girlfriends, of course. And every guy I have brought home, I've gotten the same feedback from my family. He seems a little soft. He's not as masculine. Are you sure? And it wasn't until I found the healthy version of my favorite kind of archetype of person that I was able to have that fulfilling relationship. Marshall is more my type than less my type, but still not my type because he lacks the confidence that I want to see in people. I think there's a certain confident confidence people have in themselves that it doesn't matter what the world says about them. They're just like, okay, cool. Marshall, though, I love Marshall. His facial expressions, his like, I love that. I love his facial expression. I love everything about Marshall's face. I love him as a person. I think Marshall's a really great guy, but I can see how that type of person isn't quite what other people want. Okay, moving on. You talk about masculinity and that struggle. Talk about Chelsea and Kwame. Talk about that thought of deserving love. Who deserves love? Kwame obviously had his own conundrum with the situation. And I think that Chelsea's dominance and masculinity compared to Kwame's confidence, stability, and masculinity mixed in with a little bit of his femininity kind of balanced each other actually out pretty well. In some in some reality, if Kwame would just let Chelsea be the top, I think their relationship would flourish. Now, that doesn't mean that Kwame is not a man or he's not confident, but it's to say that when it comes down to it, Chelsea has a sense of direction that's a little bit more pointed. Now, whether or not that makes a good teammate is dependent on the other half. And I just want to say that obviously if Chelsea wants it to work with Kwame, she has to be a good listener. And I think she fails on many points in that regard. She tends to get a little defensive. I'm not trying to put that blame on Chelsea. I'm trying to say in order to be the person you're supposed to be for Kwame, you have to listen to his needs. And that's kind of a key thing that I think Kwame is really good about clearing up with Chelsea. He's really good at advocating for himself, even through their miscommunication moments. I think he makes it pretty clear what he needs. And Chelsea still has to decide if she's going to consider his feelings enough to make this relationship work. When we woke up this morning, first thing that I said to Chelsea was, hey, are you okay? How you doing? You know? And her response to me was, do I sound okay? Or do I look okay? Almost in a really confrontational way. It kind of hit me in a weird way. Do you think it could possibly get any hotter? In here? <laughs> I'm having so much fun with you. Oh, are you? Yeah. Okay. All right. See ya. See ya. It's a tough look. Just say you're beautiful, you know? What's up? It's a tough look. I don't know what that means. It means it's a good look. I like it. Next time, next time, I'll just say you're beautiful. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, you know, just, just complimenting you the only way I know how. Why do I have to wait a week? <laughs> I just want to do it. But if we have to come down to earth for a moment, like today was a really, really tough morning for us. And stop smiling. <laughs> I'm trying to be real. I'm sorry. I know. I feel you. I'm sorry. I don't know why I'm smiling. I don't know why you're smiling. You're hella cute. I can't look at your face. Okay. <laughs> okay. So okay. I'm serious. All right. So this morning. <laughs> We wake up, you're not feeling great. Obviously, I know you're not feeling great. So I ask you, hey, how are you feeling? Are you okay? What was your response to me? I don't know. Your response was, do I sound okay? <laughs> you tell me if that sounds fair to you. Like, you're not considering the weight of the things that you're saying. You're just like, oh, fuck it, I'm gonna say I never directed it at you. And it's the stress I wonder that's frustrating me. I wanted to help you out. There's no need for this you to is, start a fight Chelsea with somebody. Under the bus, then I'm gonna this fucking is, throw you under okay, the bus. Okay, throw me under the bus. So you better get ready. Go ahead, please. Do it. Do it. It does not seem nice. It does not seem considerate. 
I understand the things, but you don't have to like nitpick every little thing. I'm not nitpicking. I'm telling you how you how you approach things, how you go after conversations, how you always want to like chase the fight. It always just feels like everything's so confrontational, dude. Everything's so confrontational. I'm just direct. I'm just open. I don't like to like keep things in and harbor it and like I, I just don't do that. Big difference between being direct and being confrontational, baby. Now, Kwame, and I don't know Kwame in this way, but he doesn't seem like the kind of man that is threatened by a toppy woman. He doesn't seem threatened by her dominance, and he doesn't seem threatened by the idea of being the bottom. I think he would prefer to be called more neutral, more than a bottom, probably. I think a lot of men have a problem with that word, but, you know, I like it. As a switch myself, bottom, top, I don't know, babe, make the decision, don't make the decision. Well, you know, we'll work it out as teammates. But for Kwame, I can see that depending on his bubble, that could be an issue. Now, because he's from Portland and the Pacific Northwest, all these people are from the Pacific Northwest. Did you notice the theme was very different, very open? Uh, they knew like therapy language very much reminded me of Seattle when I lived there for five years. It, it was really nice. I liked how self-aware everybody was, even if it took them to the reunion to be self-aware. So when I see Kwame and Chelsea, what I would want for them is, is an openness to making it work. But they both have so much fear, even though they both clearly know who the other is or who they are as individuals, I think. And that's what was so hard a little bit. There was like an uncertainty the whole time. I think we all felt it, but they got married. So obviously we wish them all the best. And I really think they could be a super successful couple. Moving forward to... Uh, let's do Brett and Tiffany next. So Brett and Tiffany are, I call them the Hallmark couple. They're cookie cutter. They're high end Pacific Northwest. They're picture perfect wedding. Everything about them is like on a postcard. And I like that. I like that they picked partners that could be teammates. I think Brett literally said, I considering the background he came from, he did want somebody who will help him get out of that um, that cycle of generational poverty, right? So this is where like, I love to go walking. Mm -hmm. It's where I go to like clear my head and stuff. It's like a nice uh, bougie corner. A very fitting for you, right? <laughs> wow. I had to get you, babe. Wedding is in less than two weeks. What are we gonna mm -hmm. do? I see the future so clearly. Mm -hmm. with you so I don't feel stressed and I'm sure whatever we do is going to be amazing man this feels good and I'm all in and I love you <laughs> now during this series and I gotta say this Brett's family is the best they have the best energy they're so sweet that was a great vibe for the show my dad and my family have been through a lot Hi. <laughs> My dad hasn't been on a plane since before I was born, because that's the 80s. So for him and my brother to be comfortable making this trip out here on such a short notice, it means a lot. How much did you pay a beautiful woman like that? Uh -uh. <laughs> See, I, I told you he, he was going to be joking. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's I love do it. it. I love it. So, so what do you really think of this young man here sitting beside you? I think he's amazing. I guess for me, like I've, I've, I'm 36 years old, so I've had the opportunity to, to date. I've had the opportunity to see, you know, guys out there what would be best for me. Right. And he has like a quiet confidence yeah. about him. Right. I'll yeah. say that. Not yeah. arrogance, but confidence. Yeah. And I, I love a man that is just self-assured. That's so he just became very captivating, didn't he? Yeah, he did. <laughs> you can see how different Brett is from his father and his brother. And I think there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's just when we're telling our story, if we're thinking of who we are in the anime or in the, the book, we're thinking of what character we are. Brett is the character that came from an environment, popped his bubble, and moved to a different environment to be someone different than the bubble he grew up in. And I think that's great as long as it doesn't come from self-loathing or self-hate. I feel like Brett comes more from the mindset. Now, he said this, so that's why I think this. He said that he wants to break that curse of generational poverty which I think is really commendable. And as somebody myself who's always questioning, should I worry about generational wealth? Y'all, it's hard to go from lower middle class or poverty to middle class to upper middle class. And then you have to decide who you're taking with you, which of your relatives are you paying for? Which one of your siblings are you giving money to? Are you giving money to anyone? Are you helping them get a job? It is a huge responsibility to be the child that leaves the chain of poverty or the chain of wherever you ended up. It's very hard and people are not always rooting for you. Now, I hope that Brett comes from a family where they're rooting for him. It seems like it, but it, I'm not going to be surprised if some of his relatives somewhere down the line, cousins, somebody might not have the best things to say because jealousy and envy are 
a, a clear part of just being a human. They're part of that lived experience. But I commend Brett for wanting to be better than the place he came from as an immigrant, not myself, but my parents. I think that's always the hope is that I'm going to be better off than where my parents were and then my kids are going to be better off than where I am. And I think that that is good, that desire to want to be better than the last generation. It's as if to say, thank you for doing all this hard work. Let me take it over and continue the leg legacy. You know what I mean? I think in general, Tiff and Brett will probably do pretty well in marriage. I'm not sure if they're going to make it in the long run, but I wouldn't be surprised if they did. They're pretty well matched. I think as long as they stay really good teammates, they'll, they'll be fine. I want to go to Zach and Bliss next, and then we're going to stop on Micah and Paul, and then I'm going to go through why I'm bringing this all up step by step, because I think, again, the idea throughout this podcast is we're going to think about the idea of like deserving love, that idea that somebody should want to marry you, right? So Bliss and Zach had this crazy love triangle with Irina, and there was complications, confusion. It was very uncomfortable, but it was also kind of honest. I actually thought Zach and Irina had the most honest conversation when they were brushing their teeth and breaking up when they were in the bed and they were breaking up when they were really saying yeah I think we should just end this there was something really determined about both of them that I really thought was commendable I think it was a little confusing because during the series my partner and I did actually google who was doing what with their lives because we were curious what these people did for a living and when we found it arena had a, a business in the pacific northwest curating like high-end picnics we are dinner parties or receptions we were kind of like, oh, is she on the show to promote her business? Now, here's the thing. Hear me out. I'm a YouTuber. So realistically, if I was good at my job, I would always be promoting it. One of the things I don't do as a YouTuber is ever advertise that I'm a YouTuber. I never tell anyone in my personal life. I never bring it up. It's not something I talk about. This is really a place I go to to share a very specific part of myself with you guys. And then I turn it off and I go back to my real life. But there is a part of me that knows that if I was better at my job, I would always be promoting it. Trisha Paytas years ago went on Big Brother, went on so many shows to get famous, and it worked to some extent, right? It really paid off. The problem is, is I don't want to be famous, and I'm not sure Irina does either. She seems very in conflict. A part of her wants to see herself as successful, which I think she probably is to some extent, and very young. Everyone's so young. And then on the other side of it, I think she obviously has a lot to work on, and I think she knows that too. So I don't want to make another podcast dragging her because I think, unlike certain people from season three, Zeneb, I think that Irina has, an, has a chance to get better, and so I want to give her that opportunity. We'll see what happens in the fallout. I think other than Jackie, I haven't seen much drama on social media, though I have not looked it up if I'm going to be real with you guys. I've only heard it from like Dr. Uh, Kirk Honda or other people I watch who follow this Love is Blind series. So I'm not really sure if anyone else is creating as much drama, but I think that Jackie was probably the only one and her friends who leaked text messages and things are probably the only ones. What's interesting is that I'm looking at Zach and Bliss and I'm trying to figure out, are they toxic? Are they dysfunctional? Or are they healthy? Are they settling? Are they confused? I think mostly they're actually pretty well matched. By the end of the series, I think both my partner and I were like, man, they're kind of the best couple. But they're only the best couple because they're strangely very compatible. I think Zach, I could be wrong, but I think Zach and Bliss feel very tism to me. They feel very on the spectrum to me. They feel very neurodivergent to me. So I'm not sure if they're neuro neurodivergent, but they feel very strongly neurodivergent. And so I was kind of excited to see them end up together because I think it's really hard when you're neurodivergent to end up with people who are going to see you and understand you and not think you're creepy. And I think that's what's so sad is through the series, I think I had the same inclination that everyone else did, which was to assume Zach was kind of creepy. But he's not. I think he's just kind of neurodivergent and different and overall probably pretty nice. I also, especially after I saw some of the ways that Love is Blind cut the show, I also had a better, of opi a better opinion of him after. You know what I mean? Bliss, I think the moment that I knew that I loved you was when I told you goodbye. And it was when you were gone that I thought about you and how your actions speak so much more loudly than anything anyone could ever say. Gosh, there's like so much I could say. I think the biggest thing is your perception on the world is so beautiful and you, you really believe in second chances. You believe in seeing the best in people. Just like meeting a man that is so kind is a unique thing. So I, I think just to be optimistic, that he's probably fine and that him and Bliss are probably going to be pretty happy together, actually. Now, 
Okay, hold on. Oh, I have so many things I want to say now. Now that I'm like warming up. Okay, so Paul and Micah are so interesting to me. Okay, so we're going to review them. So Paul and Micah are so funny to me for so many reasons. First and foremost, Paul is also neurodivergent, right? Am I crazy? This man is so analytical and science focused, but also it feels a little neurodivergent to me as well. Unlike Micah, who does not feel neurodivergent so much as single child, very spoiled. And I don't mean it offensively. I just mean it to be what it is that sometimes kids who are only children get so much love and attention from their parents so much. Why wouldn't someone want to marry you? Why wouldn't someone want to be with you that they forget that you have to also earn love? Now, earning love looks different for all of us. So as I observed Paul and Micah, who I think gave us the best opportunity to talk about whether or not we deserve love, I think what needs to be observed here is that they are real people with real feelings. So anything I'm saying is purely from watching the show, not from talking to them in real life, okay? I want to say that that Micah's a person and Paul's a person. They're all people. And I really just want to, you know, just send that message out to everybody as we're as we're contemplating why these people do what they do. You know, it's kind of strange because they're real people. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> like big time. Um, are we taking shots? No. Oh. I shot for a failed proposal. <laughs> <laughs> failed proposal? Whoa. <laughs> Woo. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm not like guys like that. I'm like, dude, chill. We're salty as fuck. Like, why do you say that? First of all, take it down a notch because how I am is never malicious. Mm. And you know me. I'm trying you to. You think I'm someone that's malicious? How are you? I'm doing fantastic. It is a new day. I feel refreshed. How about you? We have both been like, you know, each other's like favorite person for a lot of this. Yes. And like, I wouldn't want it any other way. I feel so strongly about you as a person, but I feel like um, that maybe like the slow burn is how it's supposed to go. I think that we should explore other connections. OK, cool. That works for me. Well, uh, thank you for taking your time, for listening. It was fantastic getting to know you. And I hope that works out for you to the best of your ability. I truly wish you the most luck. Uh, thank you for being transparent with me. Um, and hey, it's been real. Have a great rest of your night, OK? okay. I'm just having a tough time. Irina, wait, wake up and talk to me. It was him. Who? Oh, Tommy. Where'd he go? I like it. Okay, what happened? It was bad because not because he reacted, just because like he didn't. It was very weird. Like I wasn't expecting it to like be like that. Like not in a bad way. Like he's like, okay, I wish you the best. Like I gotta go by. He literally wanted to marry you like yesterday. So how is Paul still in there with Amber? He's supposed to be ending it with her right now. Wait, who's this that? Ending it with Amber. Oh, hello. Oh, I was hoping it was you. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I'm happy. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be here talking to you. I, uh, so. I can't I can really hear you. You're kind of mumbling. I want you to know that I really do believe that what's what's best for me is also what's best for you. Of course, yeah. You're everything I would want in a partner. It took me two seconds to end it with call me. How I am is never malicious. Dude, what the fuck is going on in that pod? Amber, I want you to know that, like, the connection that I have with you is real, and I... And I do love the person that you are. I don't know how to say it, but uh, I think there's only so far that you can take it with two people. I think that I have to go with um, another another connection. I'm really having really bad anxiety right now. I just got played like a fiddle. Okay, what do you want to get back with Kwame? Shut the fuck up. That's not the point. Why the fuck would they still be in there? She's crying and laughing. How did you she crying and laughing? Go stand by the, the thing and listen. How I am is never malicious. No, but don't be obvious. Don't let them see you. How I am is never malicious. <laughs> it's never malicious. When, when's it gonna be my turn? Abort! <laughs> Abort! The thing that stood out to me, I think, the most is that Micah felt genuinely in love, but so in conflict. And I think Paul felt sort of in love in an extreme conflict. There were moments of the show where I was like, oh, wait, are they vibing? 
And then there are parts of the show where I'm like, they are not having the same conversation. So you guys know that I have a theory, philosophy, theory, belief. I have a belief that the best, most compatible couples are going to be people who have values in common and see the world similarly. Not perfectly, not exactly on the same page, but similar. Like, to look at the world and say, ah, yes, I agree. This is a bush. This is a tree. This is a rock. Versus somebody else you might be interacting with might be like, this is an organism living in the earth and like living off the sustenance of the, you know, so people have a different way of talking, a different way of viewing. And it's really important that you match that uniqueness together. And, and Micah and Paul, though, somewhat makes sense like the nerdy guy with the kind of pretty girl it doesn't really work in the long run and I'm not talking about the stereotype of the nerdy guy and the pretty girl I'm talking about them in particular so this unit in particular it doesn't quite fit and I think it's for many reasons that Paul put out himself and this is okay this is where the crux of the conversation is deserving love again when we ask ourselves what does it mean to say that I deserve love now, I believe love is conditional and then unconditional. I think you love people conditionally, you like people conditionally, and then you can love them unconditionally, but still not even like them. Now, these are different types of relationships you can have with another person. So for Paul and his consciousness to look at Micah's and hers and for their theirs to meet and kind of interact, there was obviously some natural tension. I don't mean to criticize Micah so harshly, and it might sound that way, but I think Paul was accurate in saying that Micah doesn't seem nurturing. This is very important. I understand that every person has a different energy and I know that in some communities that means something but I just mean that vibe that people give you you know that oh like that guy kind of feels like he's gonna pick a fight with me oh this girl feels like she's judging me Micah does not give me mom vibes Micah gives me a woman who is a princess she reminds me a lot of the best friend on Prince and the Princess and the Frog Tiana's best friend. She reminds me a lot of that girl, spoiled, only child, me, 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 gimme, gimme, gimme. But she also has like this humble bone to her. And I can't figure out how to unlock it, but I think Paul got the closest. I really think Paul got the closest to unlocking Micah's humility, but it wasn't enough. And I think that's why she was so into him because she was like, this man makes me want to change. When she was around Paul, she was better than when she was around her friends or around Arena. So I think there's something to be said about better influence people you rub elbows with the problem with Paul and Micah being together is Paul's right none of Micah's friends are nurturing none of them seem like mom material to me none of them have good warm energy and Paul deserves somebody who will share in that warmth of that energy think 1980s suburban mom think sweet mom and dad who like hold their kids and like really want to be there for them like to be honest with you I wouldn't leave my cat with Micah I feel like she wouldn't know how to take care of my cat or she'd be too afraid to take care of my cat she feels a little bit like a pretty girl who's afraid to get her hands dirty and I think if you're a mom or a dad you have to be ready to get your hands dirty so maybe that's what Paul was seeing in her now how would Micah have des like does that mean that Micah doesn't deserve love or did she not deserve Paul's love I think Micah and all of us deserve the love that we have a relationship with that we know how to give and take from the love we know how to express I think we're only as good as we are so Micah is deserving of love based off of the tools she has. And what I mean to say by that, because that can be very confusing, is the consciousness that is Micah, who was mean girl, who was talking badly, who wasn't being catering or nurturing to any of the women who were crying, who wasn't being thoughtful or considerate, right? She's signaling to the world that this is the kind of love you'll get from me. And that doesn't feel like a very deserving love. That doesn't feel like she loves herself to me. It doesn't feel like she herself is saying that we deserve to be loved warmly or kindly because she doesn't seem to exhibit that herself, neither towards herself nor towards other people. So I think Paul especially after hearing some rumors and seeing some of the drama and meeting her friends, maybe got the feeling that the love that Micah deserves is one she can't even fathom really having. The fact that Micah during the during the altar scene made Paul go first, even though she was called on first, signaled to Paul and to me and to my partner and to everyone watching, she doesn't want to be vulnerable. She doesn't want to be the one to make the leap. She won't do the work. So she's not deserving of work from Paul. And again, this isn't to criticize Micah the human or Paul the human. It's just to say, if you find yourself in a situation where you are constantly 
confused why people don't want to be with you, ask yourself, do you even want to be with you? In a real way, not in an arrogant, narcissistic way, but in a real way. Hey, are you considerate? Hey, have you thought about people? Do you think ahead? Do you think about what they'll have to worry about tomorrow? Are you just thinking about, well, you know, who cares? Somebody else will figure it out. Everyone has a different attitude. But some people I don't think deserve warm, consistent love the way other people do because they're not putting in the effort to give it back. Symbiotic relationships work because we're giving and taking. We're giving and taking. If we're not going to have a symbiotic interaction, then it's really going to eventually feel very bad, you know? And I'm sitting here and I'm watching Micah react to Paul around his fr- her friends and, you know, he'll use his quote unquote big vocabulary and she's just like, he's a scientist. And I'm just sitting here thinking these worlds cannot collide. This isn't one of those unique couples who get to be together because his nerdiness and her girliness just don't quite match together, but they could for another couple. So Paul, I think, made the right decision not to end up with Micah. And I think Micah's reaction to him rejecting her was also why Micah, I feel, is not going to be a person who can offer people... At this stage in her life, warm love. Again, warmth, consideration, thoughtfulness, gratitude, humility, all of these things that Micah is young and still working on. And look, everyone in this cast is really young. I'm pretty sure they're all younger than me by 10 years. (laughs) So I am not here to judge the process of these young people, but I want them to know that, you know, sometimes we don't know what we're signaling to the world. And I don't think Micah understands that the company you keep and the attitude, even the platinum blonde hair and the long extensions, or maybe that's her real hair, it's a very specific type of person. And again, I'm not here to judge how you dress yourself, but I am going to say that there is a kind of person that looks this way, talks this way, acts this way. And most of them I find in my life, and it's not the hair extension, so don't get lost on this point, guys. Don't think Brittany's literally saying people with hair extensions are these people. That's not what I'm saying. Put the whole package together they tend to be a certain kind of person. You ever see a white guy podcast and it's always those those hustle guys with the cryptocurrency? That's a type of guy, right? Micah is a type of girl. And that type of girl, they don't end up with Pauls because usually they're not loving, warm, or um, have enough humility or gratitude to even be with someone like Paul. Paul feels simple. Micah feels like high maintenance. You get what I'm saying? See, Chelsea and Kwame, They're equal levels of high maintenance. They're both high maintenance and both simple, but they're very much the same levels of high maintenance and simple. Like they're very, you get what I'm saying? There's like a vibe. Marshall and and Jackie were never going to be together because Jackie's erratic, like erratic, toxic, dysfunctional family obviously spills into her life, which means she's kind of chained to that family versus Marshall. He's felt more independent, like he had gone to therapy, maybe left his toxic family, maybe has a better relationship with them, maybe fixed dysfunction. I don't know. Don't let me project. I'm just trying to say what I'm seeing from the show, what I'm guessing from the show. There's something to be said about the way those interactions went that said to me like, oh, yeah, I can see how you might mistake each other for soulmates like Jackie and Marshall. But obviously you guys are two. You're at different places. If Jackie had been through years of therapy, if Jackie had learned to have a great boundary with her family, if Jackie was at a better place, she probably would have worked out with Marshall maybe, but maybe not. Maybe even both of them being as healthy as they can be means they can't be together because Jackie does need a more masculine person and Marshall does encompass more femininity, which again, I like, but not everybody likes that. I don't even know if Marshall would appreciate me saying that about him, but to be honest with you, as a queer woman who believes like gender and all these things are on a spectrum and all of these energies are mixed into all of us, I kind of just feel like it's cool and people should embrace it instead of knocking it. To be honest with you, all these men from the Pacific Northwest compared to other bubbles are pretty feminine. They dress nice. They put themselves together. They all look like they get their eyebrows done. So there is even in terms of culture, like a real sense of femininity in the Pacific Northwest I find in men that I don't find in other places. So again, we're not judging. We're just saying know what bubble you're in, know what stereotype you are, know what character you are in the movie, know what trope you are. 
So I'm going through this series. I'm watching with my partner. We're watching the reunion. We're watching Vanessa and Nick Lachey on their second marriages together. We're watching all these people talk about love. And to be honest with you guys, I think it's pretty clear that reality TV, though real, is still TV like YouTube. It's real, but it's still YouTube. We're still censoring ourselves. We're still watching what we say. We're still being considerate of the fact that people are listening to us and judging us. And it's very intimidating. But I think more than that, it's scary because you're on this show. And by the way, think about it. What kind of person goes on a reality TV show? What kind of a person would do this? Like my partner and I were talking about it. I was like, I would never be on a reality TV show. And he's like, but you would be a YouTuber. And I was like, right, I would be a YouTuber. Why am I okay being a YouTuber? And why am I not okay being a reality TV star? What is it about reality TV I don't like? It's the control. It's the lack of authenticity, but mostly it's the fact that these producers have control over my image, what I look like, what I sound like. At least in my own videos, I can edit them. At least in my own videos, I can decide how to present myself. I wore my Teddy Fresh today. Let's go, bro. Shout out, Eva. I wore my Teddy Fresh. I wanted to look fresh. I wanted to be chill. I wore my um, Death Note earrings. Let's go. Let's go. So, you know, I had a vibe going today. I was thinking about what I was going to do later. And I hate the idea of going on a reality TV show and having someone curate my image for me, which happened to a lot of these people. Even Barnett and Amber, was that her name? Season one, they came out and they were saying like, this show can never contact us. We're not going on this show. So people have spoken out about the show and how it impacted their lives. And I think it's as as wonderful as the concept is to love someone blindly, I think it is also disingenuous to to cohabitation and interpersonal relationships to some extent. Here's what I mean by that. What I mean by that is this. When you go on TV, when you go on YouTube, when you date in public, when you date without privacy, you are holding yourself back. There are conversations you will not have. People are already doing that in real life, denying their partner's conversations, not wanting to talk about things that will hurt feelings, not wanting to be blunt, not willing to put it out there. And then on top of that, now these people have a TV show that keeps them even more less likely to be honest. That would scare me. It would scare me. You know, oh, hmm, see, I don't want to project onto you guys. So you tell me, I look, I've dated people. I've even been proposed to. And I've never said yes until now, now, because I found a person that I genuinely want to tell everything to. No secrets, no walls, nothing. And that person is the person I've been looking for, someone I could give myself to wholly. And I don't know that I would ever be able to give myself to somebody through a TV show because they're recording their personal conversations. So unless we had time off camera to really have the real conversations, which I don't know how much time they actually get to do that, I would be scared as well going to that altar and looking at that person and saying yes to somebody that I still had questions about. I don't have any questions about my partner. Our engagement was really fast. Um, We finalized our official engagement, I think, six months into our relationship. And it was a really great process, right? June, July, August, September, November, December. So five months. And we solidified the engagement. We had, you know, our parents involved, our families involved. We, it's not the time is what I'm trying to say, right? It's not the time. It's the intimacy. How much intimacy were they able to have? Now, if they're like me and my partner who are talking all day, communicating all day, then yes, I think that that's possible. They could probably expedite two years of dating in nine weeks as long as they have the room to have those conversations. Now, we learned later on, season four, I think is when I learned it, that the pods, you can be in there for two to eight hours sometimes. Some people spend all day talking in the pods. So I do think, unlike conventional dating that takes two years to find out certain things, that this process probably expedites it. I think the show that I would like to see is more like Indian matchmaker, but with a little bit more action between the the two people dating. Something that says, hey, we want to get married. We understand that this is unorthodox. We're not trying to be totally romantic about this, but we're trying to really find that person in a very efficient way. I think that is a very interesting concept to me versus something like this. Because look, I don't think love is blind. I don't. I think love is seeing that person in everything that they are, good and bad, and choosing them. Saying, I'll build a life with you. It's like kind of saying, this is what I'm relating it to. Don't take it too seriously. But it reminds me of growing up in a colorblind society. Like, we don't see color. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
But then when you don't see color, you don't see injustice. You don't see racism. You don't see subjugation of minority communities. So that's my issue with the idea that love could be blind. And now, of course, the consciousness that is my partner, I love unconditionally. Truly, like he's absolutely a person that I can say I love unconditionally versus my former dating partners. I didn't love them unconditionally. I hadn't gotten to that point with them and I had dated some of them for three, five years and we had never reached that point of unconditional love, nor were we ever ready to get married. But with this partner that I've known literally less than a year because we did a very, like I said, courting style dating, I feel like I unconditionally, I know that I unconditionally love him because I know what it is to unconditionally love other people in my life. I unconditionally love my inner circle, my friends, the people that are the closest to me that are in my inner circle, whether they're blood related or not. I unconditionally love those people. Other people, no. My my love is conditional to an extent, right? Because that's just how it has to be. I don't have all the love I can give. I can give everyone all the love. But I think that that's what's missing from the show is that conversation about whether or not these are unconditional loving moments or if we're just rushing through this marriage to see if this experiment works. And since I think most people settle in their relationships, I think it could work for a lot of people. What's the first couple's name? The most famous couple. Hold on. We have to look it up because I always forget their names. Cameron and Lauren found it. (laughs) Okay. Cameron and Lauren were, you know. The most iconic couple of all Love is Blind. Now, there was a lot of speculation because I think Lauren was already a YouTuber when she joined the show. And people thought, again, she was doing it for money or fame or views, which, by the way, as a YouTuber, if I was better at my job, I probably would do that as well. But I just don't want fame, so I don't actually want to be on a TV show. You know what I mean? It'd be cool to talk to cool people, but I would never go on a show to try to get famous because that's just not the method I would take. But I can see why she would be smart to do that. It did come, you know, it did pose a question on whether or not her and Cam, therefore, were together because it would be good for views. Now, Cam, who obviously has been going to a black barber recently, thanks to Lauren, I'm sure, who's looking fine as hell, like, so no judgment. I think that he seems very actually comfortable around Lauren. I've been watching their YouTube channel recently just to get a vibe. And they actually seem pretty happy and compatible still. And Lauren around his folks and him around family, they seem very comfortable, which is what I was looking for. Now, them not having kids is not a big deal to me personally. As far as I know, they don't have any kids. And I think it makes sense that they would want to still date each other even after marriage. Lots of people do that where they get married to kind of date, which is fine for for them. But for me, I couldn't even imagine it. Like I could never imagine getting married unless I was 1000% sure. But I'm not trying to project my insecurities onto you. And I'm not trying to project my values onto you. But I am trying to say that if you find yourself questioning Why haven't I found love? Am I deserving? You need to ask yourself, what energy are you signaling to the world? I've got so many girlfriends of mine who are like, no one ever asks me out. I'm always single. No one asks me out. And literally, they're always getting asked out. Or I will see men looking at them. I'm like, go talk to him. He's looking at you. And they're like, no, I want it this way. And it has to be this way. And everything has to be this way. And that's fine. But yes, of course, you know. You kind of got to meet people to make it work. That's why in 2020 to 2023 or 2022, the last two years or whatever, during COVID, I went on a lot of first dates over Zoom mostly because I wasn't going to meet people in public during COVID. But I was going on Zoom dates and going on as many as it took. One guy one guy showed up to the date in a Dragon Ball Z hoodie because he knew I liked Dragon Ball Z, which I appreciate. He was so handsome. This was a handsome man. And I usually do one-hour dates with the Zoom calls, but he didn't even last 30 minutes because there was nothing to talk about, zero to talk about. I was like, Habibi, thank you so much for this date. Is it okay if we ended early? And he was like, oh, yeah. And I'm pretty sure he had gone his whole life off his looks. So no one had ever ended a date with him. He seemed fine. He didn't take it too personal. But I could definitely see a part of him was like, what's going on? But to be honest, even though he was so handsome, he had nothing to talk to me about. Like nothing of interest, no hobbies. I asked him, what is he into? Nothing. What have you done the last 10 years? He goes, not much. And I was like, oh my God. Like there's, again, no judgment. But I couldn't do that. I couldn't end up with somebody just because I thought they were handsome in a marriage. Like I would feel so claustrophobically trapped. So why do you think it is that people go on reality TV shows and are willing to get married even when they're unsure, right? Now, I do believe, and I could be wrong, Mm, I could be wrong, actually. Are any of the Love is Blind 
couples divorced. Okay, so I just looked it up to double check. So I think there's only been one divorce for Love is Blind. It says Jared and Ayana. Do you guys remember them? See, they were a great example of different kinds of couples. He was young and wanted to explore, go to the club, stay out late. She was a homebody. Again, oh my gosh, one of the conversations I had with my partner, I was like, hey, babe, just to double check, we're going to talk about doing a lot of things, but we're never going to do them, right? Meaning, like, because him and I are both homebodies, like, we're going to talk about traveling to 50 countries in a year but we're not actually going to do that right because like I need to be home I have very low energy it's like yeah I want to dream about doing this world travel thing but realistically I probably will never regret if I never travel if I'm being honest and as somebody who's about to like leave to Europe I'm going to tell you this right now that sounds exciting because my partner is there but and it does I'm so excited to be there like I'm so stoked But at the same time, I don't think I ever would have done that if I didn't have a partner. Because even though I would love to travel and see places, I'm 33 and I have only been to Belize, Europe, and that's it. Mexico as a kid, but that doesn't really count. I haven't even been to Canada and it's right there. So again, I'm not that kind of person. So when you're dating, you really got to ask yourself, without judgment, what kind of a person are you? What's your vibe? What are you into? What's the expectation of this relationship? I think Jared and Ayana both knew that they were not going to end up together. But I think it felt good. And again, Love is Blind does this amazing, amazing, amazing thing where somehow, even though it's blind, all the couples who end up together, they kind of make sense. Like it kind of makes sense. Like it, it looks like it wouldn't. But when they're together, I'm like, no, 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 I get it. This makes sense. And that's what's kind of amazing is that As humans, and again, we're talking about categorization, not just stereotyping. We're talking about categorization. We really do do best with certain types of people. So when you are that exceptional couple or that exception to the rule and you end up being the couple that ends up like, oh, that worked out, like the really tall girl and the really short guy, that's a type of stereotype of couple, you know, that does work out but often does not work out. Mostly because the men are too insecure to face the fact that their women are taller than them. Or the women are too insecure not to feel, they maybe don't feel as like feminine being tall. At least that's what I've heard from my tall friends. So again, when we're going through this conversation, we're really asking ourselves, why do we think we deserve love or that people should be with us? I've got a homie whose parent is always like, why doesn't anyone want to be with my kid? My kid is great. Why doesn't anyone want to be with my kid? And the truth is, is like, yeah, your kids are all great bros. But we all have problems we have to work on. And when we ask people to be with us for love and marriage, we had best be ready to burden them with our problems or to handle it and to have them bear the burden of maybe our comforting us or being there for us. Like, I really think matching your trauma together is really, really reasonable and efficient. My partner and I are issues. They're really compatible. Everybody has issues and everyone has issues on a spectrum. Some people have less issues. Some people have more. You know, I'd like to think that I'm almost done working on all of mine, but I'll probably be working on all of mine until the day I die. So the few I have, the few things I'm working on, like that might be forever in our marriage. But hopefully I won't burden him with all of them or worst case, the burden he'll have to face is holding me while I cry through them. But I don't want to make him the therapist to my problems. That's what a therapist is for. And same for his problems and my problems. And again, we all have problems on a spectrum. So when we face each other, you could say Jackie's problem is her family and her relationship to the family. Marshall's problem is his like fake confidence, but he's working on it because I can definitely see some confidence there, but he needs to work on it some more. It's not to say they're bad people. It's to say they're working on something, right? And I think that that often is misunderstood when dating because I think there's a lot of I'm going to save her. Marshall made that mistake with Jackie saying you're like a project I could fix, a person I could help. And I think a lot of men do want to be that shining knight. And I think Jackie and women like Jackie, parts of women like Jackie, I wouldn't say the whole of Jackie, I think they do want men to come in and rescue them. I think they don't want to be seen as a project. They want to be seen as a princess in the making or they want to be seen as a girl who's worthy of your love. And I think that Marshall had this like sort of arrogance about being such a good person that he could save Jackie. And I think that was what the one moment I thought he was kind of ugly where I was like, oh, that was like an ugly point of character for him. But I don't think he meant it maliciously. So let's play with this. Okay, when you're dating someone, you're talking about whether or not they're like an ugly person, not physically, like their their energy, their vibe, like, ooh, this person makes me feel a way. And we're not even talking about the way Arena felt about Zach. That's different. We're talking about like, oh, that's kind of 
ugly. Like you kind of have ugly ideas about people. Marshall, I think in that moment was a little ugly. He he had a disgusting thought about Jackie. Like I'm gonna, she's a project. That's the wrong way to look about look at your spouse. You should look at your spouse as not a project to fix, not your opportunity to be a white knight, not your opportunity to save your partner. I think this is my belief. Instead, you should look at your partner as somebody who's like a capable adult who's having a hard time, who's figuring it out, or an adult who's a hot mess but figuring it out, or at least they're on track to. The idea of needing to save people, I think, is a big part of society's problems. The path to road is paved in good intentions. We're always trying to help people through the means of what we think is good, and I think sometimes it really comes out ugly and I think that's what was missed there between Marshall and Jackie overall when I'm looking at these couples and I'm seeing them I'm seeing people who are figuring it out and definitely know themselves in different ways like every single person on the show has a different relationship with themselves right and I and I love that for all of them. And I really wish them all the success in the world. But I do think that Love is Blind is a great opportunity for us to reflect on our um, character flaws, uh, the habits we have, the things we do. Look, I'm a pretty blunt person and I appreciated that about Chelsea. But I think she could have been more blunt sometimes with Kwame. I really like Kwame because he's so chill. But sometimes it did feel like he was keeping a secret. And I know that if I was on TV, I probably would look that way as well. And I think that ultimately is going to be the problem with these types of relationship games is that this TV show is a game and not everybody went in it and in, went into it to find a husband or a wife. Some people went into it for the wrong reasons. Now, I don't know exactly who those people were. I don't know if it's anyone who even got married. But without a doubt, when this kind of a show gets made, like we saw in previous seasons, you know there are going to be there going to be people there with bad intentions. So just like in real life, unlike, well, I guess. The re okay, I guess the reality TV show and real life is the same in this way, that there's always a game being played. And it's a matter of which game. Ask your partners. Are you playing the life game, the make money game, the have kids game, the be middle class game, the be stay in poverty game, the be upper middle class game? You know, which game are we playing? What kind of lifestyle do we want? Do we want to be the wild thornberries? Or do we want to be the Rugrats? Do we want to be Rocket Power where our kids are all doing sports? Do we want to be any of the couples on Love is Blind? Do we want to be? The question is, do who do you want to be? And then the privilege, if you're in America at least, that you're born into really allows you to probably do that. If you have the discipline to get there. If you have the the relationship with yourself where you can actually ask yourself, am I the problem and how do I fix it? When you can get to that point, I think you can get just about anything you want out of life. But I think that's the first step is recognizing that we're all playing a game. Which game is it? And everyone, there's a wholesome games, there's malicious games, there's loving games, there's mean games. And then once you figure out what game you're playing, um, and maybe in conjunction or maybe before you figure out, well, who are you and what are you doing? I kind of did it together you know what game do I want to play right now okay the survival game make sure I can eat make sure I have a place to sleep that was like a game I used to play when I was younger and now I'm playing the game of how do I save money for a house that's my next game and I'm not doing great at it guys I am losing this game but I'm gonna try to be better at it and I know that's a fault of mine I know I am the reason I am bad at saving for a house I know that's me. That's my responsibility. So it's easy because it doesn't feel offensive to be like, oh, cool, it's me. Wait, it's me. That means I can fix it. Because if the problem was with somebody else, well, I can't fix them because they're not projects to be fixed. They're people on a journey and I can only wait for them to finish. So thank God that I am the problem because it means I can work on it right now versus waiting for somebody else to figure it out. So in your life, figure out what game you're playing, who you are, why you're playing the game you're playing, be open to changing the game based off of context and circumstance, and then make sure to ask your partners the same things. What do you want out of life? I think Tiffany and Brett were probably the best example of couples who had an image, a vision, and then they're going to teammate work it into success. I think they're probably going to be the best teammates through this process. I think Chelsea and Kwame are really authentic and therefore have the best chance at having an extremely honest, vulnerable relationship for the rest of their lives, which, which would be amazing. And then I think Zach and Bliss are so, and I mean this with the, the nicest way possible, I didn't get enough of them to really understand them as a full character, but they did seem the most naive and romantic and also sweetest. They were just so sweet about being in love. And I think there's something about that that is really adorable and 
almost innocently naive in a way that makes me question their success rate only because real adulting takes real struggle. Now, Zach comes from a background of struggle and he's a lawyer, so we know he's capable of certain things. And at this moment in time, I am forgetting what Bliss does for a living, actually. I'm completely, let's Google. Okay, the, according to this website, I will link it down below. This is South Puget Sound Community College. She started working with Ocean Beauty Seafoods as a senior quality control analyst in 2014. She currently works as a senior manager for Disney. In addition, she has worked at Microsoft as a program manager and Nayamode, Nayamode as a sales operation lead. Okay, Bliss is Bliss is uh, Bliss is a real like a uh, she a worker. She a worker. Be okay, Bliss. Okay, Bliss. Okay, never mind. Bliss also has her shit together. So Bliss is also somebody who. Oh, this is. Oh, this makes so much more sense. Zach and Bliss are both, and again, projecting neurodivergency, and they both have like very stressful jobs that they've been successful at. And I, oh, now I'm seeing their compatibility even more. Yeah. Okay. Fun. I really think they're going to do pretty well together. I hope, I hope it ends up being a success for all the couples who got married. And if anyone from the show ever saw this video, like, please hit me up. I think you're all interesting. And I would love to know what makes you want to go on a show like this. Because again, as a YouTuber, I don't know why you would think it would be similar. I just couldn't bring myself to go on a show like this. But yet I'm a YouTuber. It's like, what's the difference? But yet it's a vibe. And that's exactly the nuance I want you to see when you're dating. When you're dating, ask, are you a YouTuber kind of person or a reality TV show kind of person? Are you the kind of person that would go on a reality TV show or be a YouTuber? These are different kinds of people. These are different specific kinds of people. Okay? All right. That's all I have to say on this episode. Thank you so much for being here. Now, there was a, oh, wait, wait, before I go, there were a lot of points in this show that I thought I could make individual videos on. So you might see more content using them as examples. But if you have any comments or questions or content ideas, please let me know. Because again, I love watching this show and I'm curious on how things go. I'm a big fan of experiments and interpersonal relationships, but mostly I'm interested to see what these kinds of shows allow us to learn about ourselves. So maybe tell me something you learned about yourself and yeah. Okay, now I think I'm done. Thank you for watching. Have the most fantastic day and I'll see you next video. Bye. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Da 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 da